Welcome to the Global Gaming Business Podcast, the industry's first and longest running podcast now in our 18th year. I'm your host, Jess Marquez, and our guest today is Michael Silberling, CEO of Metropolitan Gaming, to talk about his impressive and globetrotting career, the current state of the UK gaming market, and the future goals for Metropolitan within that market and beyond. Today's GGB podcast is sponsored by IGT. IGT is paving the way of cashless gaming yet again with 14 properties live in North America. Resort Wallet combined with IGT Pay is quickly becoming the preferred method of cashless gaming for both players and operators. Learn more at IGT.com slash cashless. Michael, thank you so much for joining me today. It's uh, it's a great pleasure to have you on. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you for having me. Hello from uh, from London. Yes, it's uh, it's early morning for me. It's kind of late afternoon for you, so it's uh, it's nice to nice for you to uh, join me today. Um, I, usually in, in these interviews, I like to start with the guests first, and, uh, and this one is uh, is no no different. And I was looking at your um, your experience, and I've said multiple times on the show before that I'm just a LinkedIn fiend. You know, it's just such a it's such a great resource for me to just quickly learn about you know some of these people that I talk to, and I was. I was genuinely, really, honestly impressed by your uh, by your list of experiences. I mean, it pretty much touches every sector of the gaming industry, from U.S. international, commercial, tribal. I mean, you name it, it's in there. So, could you kind of just do a run through of like this this crazy experiences and kind of what led you to this point uh, with Metro? Sure, sure. Um, you know, I've worked in New Zealand, Australia, Africa, Middle East, Asia, Canada. Uh, throughout the United States, South America. Um, if you're familiar with the gaming industry, if you can imagine the licensing burden um, from be it Missouri or uh, the UK or Nevada, any of these places. So, um, you know, I've worked for, as you say, private and public companies. I've worked for family business, private equity, tribal, government. Um, so I certainly have had the the, the range. And you know, through that, it's always been casino centric, but I've had zoos and game parks and hotels and restaurants and nightclubs and golf courses and marinas and, you know, you, you, you name it. Uh, I, I, I've done it. Um, and I have to say, I didn't really set out on a path to, to, to do that. Uh, the, the geographic scope, uh, the casino industry, I'm from Silicon Valley. Uh, I graduated uh, with an MBA um, from from UCLA. I thought I'd go back to Silicon Valley, and I saw that there was a company recruiting in Reno and Tahoe, and I've always loved uh, Tahoe, and I'm familiar with with, with Reno as well, uh, having uh, gone to uh, elementary school in Washoe County, lived on Old Franktown Road. So, you know, I thought I'd go work for a few years in the casino business, and head back to Silicon Valley. And that was right when the casino business was expanding internationally, tribal, riverboats. Uh, It was a very exciting time joining what was promised companies who subsequently became Harrah's and and, and then Caesars. Um, They were only in Nevada and Atlantic City at that point. But right when I joined, they were doing all all these sectors in international, in tribal, in riverboats. So I ended up less than a year after joining in, in New Zealand. Uh, as the first U.S. employee joining uh, a fellow from Australia and a woman from New Zealand in what was the largest private equity investment in the history of of New Zealand. Um, And I did that for a few years. We opened that successfully. The Sky Tower, you know, I mentioned zoos and game parks. We had the Sky Tower, which is still the iconic element of the Auckland skyline today. Um, and I went back to uh, to Las Vegas and I thought a little bit, should I go back to Silicon Valley or am I going to go all in in this rapidly growing and expanding casino business? And I decided to go all in, in in the casino business. I've always asked myself with these different jobs, can I do the job and contribute? Will I will I learn and grow my skill set and will it be interesting and fun? And, you know, answering those questions in the affirmative it has, has literally led me all over the world and once again in a casino centric manner into all of these different uh, operational zones and and you know i'm proud that i left sky city in new zealand and they hired me back in australia i'm proud that i left you know harris caesars in reno and they hired me back in 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 the midwest and subsequently the the uk i'm proud that i left silver point in las vegas and they've hired me back in the uk so i can't have done 
everything wrong. But, you know, earlier in my career, I looked at, can I get more revenue under management? Can I get more employees under management? Can I get the size of the properties under management? I think I'm at the stage in my career now, which is, you know, can I participate uh, in, in, in the equity position? And is there upside in these businesses, you know, which is very, very interesting to me. So I'm no longer saying I need to manage the multi-billion dollar companies and properties, but, you know, what's the business opportunity, which is, uh, you know, equally fascinating to me at this stage in my career. So I don't know if that answered your question, but certainly it's taken me around the globe. Well, definitely. Yeah. And I wouldn't expect, you know, with, with that range of experience, I wouldn't expect a direct answer. Right. I mean, uh, that's not how uh, these things work. And it's, it's cool to know that, you know, despite our, uh, our various paths that we still have some common ground, uh, Washoe County alums. Uh, so that's nice to know. Um, so with reference to the London slash UK market overall, um, I know that you had spent some time previously with London clubs and obviously now you're, you're back in the market. So what was it something particular about the UK or London specifically that was, that was appealing to you that made you want to go back, especially, um, you know, when at the time it was kind of still in the middle of COVID and we didn't really know it was a lot of uncertainty. So what, what is it about the UK market that you find appealing? Well, look, I don't always fo follow the advice of, uh, of buy low, sell high. Um, but you know, the, the hospitality business worldwide, the casino business worldwide has really been brought to its knees by the pandemic and COVID and, 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 and closure. Um, and the business that, that Silver Point bought here was no exception to that. You know, a proud business with a long history and great assets, but had been forced to, uh, to, to close. Um, and it was clear that Caesars had a domestic U.S. focus you know, why is it clear? Because they said that in public <laughs> statements <laughs> that they had a domestic U.S. business. So you had this, you know, somewhat unloved overseas assets that had been closed, had been underinvested in. And Silver Point, who I said I've worked for uh, before, um, you know, really thought that by putting a little bit of attention in the size and scope of the business that might have been below Caesar's radar, um, and a rising tide floats all boats. So coming out of COVID and reopening the, the, the business, you know, we thought that we could get this business back on its feet again. So, you know, the, the, that's the list, a new ownership that I've worked for before, an owner that's, that's experienced in the gaming sector and willing to uh, invest. Um, Caesars had really not paid much attention and invested in these smaller assets overseas. So I think it's a very exciting time for the, for the company as we, as we rebirth from uh, COVID and we have a new owner that's very focused on, on this size and scale of, 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 of business. And as we'll probably talk about later, we've done a lot of things in a short period of time. Well, and uh, yeah, exactly. And I kind of want to, um, you know, as somebody with a, a, as diverse of a range of experiences as yourself, I mean, I have to imagine that even for you, the last two years, you know, in this role has been sort of a whirlwind. I mean, even the people that I talked to that have been, you know, in their same position for 10 plus years, these last, these last two years have been, <laughs> so what's it, what's it been like for you and the team since taking over? I mean, it's almost like starting a new business, right? There were so many uh, employees that have been furloughed, all the businesses are shut. So you're really deciding how much, uh, money to deploy into this business. How many people do you hire back? How quickly do you hire them back? How much capital do you put into the business? How much do you infuse into the marketing programs, uh, et, et, et cetera? So, you know, in the last two years, and I, and I have to admit that uh, I, throughout the world, I imagine the U.S. as well, but certainly in Europe and U.K., there's been some macroeconomic headwinds. So we've had three prime ministers dealt with COVID like everybody else, had four chancellors, four chancellors, two monarchs, the largest European war since World War II, pushing energy costs and inflation to double digit levels. Um, you know, depending on your opinion on, on, on Brexit it's, and, and the pandemic, it's certainly difficult to find hospitality staff um, as, as chefs as an example, croupiers are, are, are an example. There was a large portion of our workforce that were not naturalized UK and had challenges with Brexit coming back into the country. So, you know, a lot of stuff happening, but, but despite that, uh, we purchased a new casino, Park Lane, we sold our South Africa 
business. We launched a new brand. We rebranded, refurbished, and relaunched Metropolitan Mayfair. We built a new loyalty program. We have a new app. We have a new online site. We have, you know, kept some very, very strong management, but brought on some new folks uh, as well. Uh, we're looking forward to, you know, what happens with with with, with the white paper. So I've, no one's ever accused me of being a patient person, and I always want to do more faster. But when I look back at the, you know, less than 24 months that I've been here, we've done a lot. Definitely. And, you know, you, you, you touched on a lot of things there, and I kind of want to parse, you know, some of them out as we go. But I want to start with, uh, actually, and here I'm chuckling to myself because here we are, two, two Americans talking about uh, London. But... Um, what is the state? I'm, I'm curious, you know, what is the state of the London market specifically in 2023? I was there uh, earlier this year for the first time in ICE, and it was just really a, a cool experience for me just to see, you know, gaming in a new light and see it, you know, in a new a new way, which I, as we've talked about a lot, I'm sure you've seen many different markets. So what is what's London gaming uh, as of right now in 2023? I know you guys have some venues in the market. Um, are you, you know, are you looking for more growth potential? Are you current? Are you uh, content with your co- current holdings? Uh, London, just what, what's what's London? Yeah, so we have uh, uh, five licenses deployed across four venues with a spare license to deploy as well. I mentioned we bought Park Lane, we refurbished and reopened Metropolitan uh, Mayfair. I would love to do some work in, in, in Leicester Square, which is perhaps the UK's equivalent of Times Square in terms of high uh, visitation uh, there. London is such a dynamic place. Despite my accent, I do have UK citizenship. I I have been here uh, before. I think Samuel Johnson said, when you're tired of London, you're tired of life. Um, (laughs) And and in one sense, that's great because you have so many people here from so many backgrounds and so many different things to do. But on the other hand, you have very fierce competition for the leisure dollar uh, when you are here between sports and West End shows and, you know, movie premieres and, 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 and all the rest. So, you know, you really need to be on, on top of your game. London, I think, has several micro markets. Mayfair uh, has some of the, the top high end, particularly table game play uh, in, the, in, in the world. Uh, with domestic uh, UK folks, with people, but largely international visitors from the Middle East, from Asia, from India, uh, et cetera. So, um, you know, the, the, the level of play in, in, in London is equal to anything that I've seen in uh, Las, Las Vegas um, as, as I've gone around the, the world. Um, our other casinos, we have two in Mayfair, which is I describe as this high-end market, uh, we have one in Leicester Square, which is the most visited place and you know the most foot traffic of anywhere in, in Europe. So that's much more of a high volume place. And we have one over by Edgware Road, which is uh, a largely ethnic Middle Eastern area as well. So you've got very different customer demographics. And um, you know we we are pro London, having bought a new casino, having refurbished and reopened another casino. That said, we haven't seen the international visitation come back to London uh, in in the gaming sector as quickly as we would want it to. We didn't have the economic stimulus package, which I guess is not uh, international. That's kind of domestic UK business. But we didn't have that money going into the system like it did in the US, which has its own dynamics because some of that money made its way into leisure spend and some of that leisure spend in the US, be it movie theaters, sports tickets or casinos, I, I, I imagine would have would, would have helped. So, you know, it is we are doing, you know, consistently year over year, uh, better, uh, much better than the year before. But our aspirations for the business are, are greater still. And for that to happen, just one example of many, China was in lockdown until very recently. We would like the Chinese business to resume visiting London. And that hasn't happened yet. So I won't go through the whole list. But while we're pleased to be in London and, and with everything we've done, uh, we still would like to see more, better, faster uh, in, uh, in, in, in town. IGT's all-new electronic table game offers a completely redesigned hardware and software solution built from the ground up. It includes live, virtual, and hybrid games, all the best side bets, 
and a brand new wheel housing that delivers faster wheel spins and what we believe to be the most dependable roulette wheel on the market. Discover what the buzz around IGT's newest electronic table game solution is all about. Visit IGT.com slash ETG to learn more. Well, it's fascinating how, you know, despite all the differences in microcosms, you know, Las Vegas and London still kind of have the same uh, fundamental problem still. And that's the lack of, you know, the, the return of the international travel. That's that's fascinating and definitely a great city. I can't wait to go back. That's for sure. Um, speaking more to in the terms of uh, demographics, and this is something that, again, you know, again, touching on your experience, I'm sure you have a very uh, uh, astute knowledge of, but how do UK players differ from US players in their wants and kind of preferences and, and such? And I described all the different, you know, continents and countries and places I've worked before. You know, I think there's more ways that players are the same, right? They want a safe environment. They want to feel they have a chance to win. They want a variety of product. They want service and to be rewarded and recognized. They like a good meal and drink. It's largely an entertainment experience for their leisure dollar. And I found that in South Africa outside of Johannesburg. And I found that in Australia. And I found that in South America and Punta del Este, wherever I go. You know, what is different is largely the, the, the customer demographic uh, and the regulatory environment. Because the regulatory environment shapes, to some extent, the type of venue that you can build. So as an extreme example, we can only have 20 slot machines per venue uh, currently in the, in the UK. So where you would typically see tremendously more machines in the US and to the extent that machines have a female uh, you know, majority player bias uh, and we have uh, relatively more table games so we would have more males than females in the UK business than we would in the US business. And that's not because how we want to build a business or how we want to market the business. That's just the way the regulatory regime is set up. Someone could spin 50,000 pounds on a roulette wheel, but we have stakes and limits, two pounds, five pounds on slot machines. So it's quite trying to be nice here. It's quite counterintuitive to me <laughs> how the government decides someone can spend 50,000 pounds at risk on a roulette wheel and can't put more than a few pounds at risk on a, on a machine. But that really, you know, to, to a large extent dictates and limits what we can build. And, and I also described the, even in London, these micro markets, uh, Leicester Square is near Chinatown. You know, we have a large Asian market there. You can come into my place and get dim sum or noodle soup or duck fried rice or whatnot. And yet my place over on Edgware Road is, is largely Middle Eastern. So if you're going to come there, I'm going to serve you hummus and shishtuk and, and in, you know, hot meze and cold meze. So um, I think those are the two things that, that, that differ is kind of the demographics and the, and, and the, and the regulatory uh, environment. Well, it's interesting how you touched on the regulatory part of it, because that was uh, the nice segue into my next kind of line of questioning. But, you know, it's pretty impossible in this in this day and age, you know, to talk about the UK market without a lot of the, you know, regulatory headwinds that have been made in the last year or so. I mean, the uh, I can only speak from my experience. I mean, we did so I remember doing so many stories and so many articles about the lead up to the publication of the white paper and the aftermath since. And it's just it's it's uh, it's interesting to say the least and obviously as an american who is not used to the uk market i it's it's tough to really make wide you know assessments or analyzations or anything like that but as somebody you know who's literally on the ground you know as an operator what has been kind of the uh, the reception of since the publication and kind of uh, i want to start first on how it's affected the the retail casino space obviously it it was very much centered on online gaming but how is it? How have you seen it affect your your land based business at all? Well, it has been a period of time, isn't it? I think they announced the review in 2019, and yeah. <laughs> I, you know, if you told me it was four or six or eight times that they delayed yep. the announced publish date, I would remember how hot, no matter how high the number went, of the number of times they delayed publication, I would I would believe you. We were running. The reality out. is, yeah. <laughs> we, <laughs> it, it's. It's, it's all vaporware right now, right? You know, it's, it's not really in place. Um, 
to to, to have a little bit of a, of a of a laugh. The government published this white paper and now wants to talk about what it published. <laughs> so they're in what's called consultation yep. now, which is they're consulting with the various interest groups, some of which are, you know, pro gaming and some of which are, you know, have have questions and, and concerns. So they're taking what they've published and they're discussing that with various constituents. What we've seen is very positive, um, you know, and I, I like to take a customer centric point of view. So, you know, if what happens with more machines happen, that will give customers more choice. And, you know, we've heard various vendors in addition to IGT and Novomatic um, that are now talking about coming to to market. So, you know, I don't want to name them and put pressure or be wrong, but, you know, if some of these world-class uh, machine manufacturers do come to the UK, the customer is going to do nothing but benefit from, from the increased choices that are available to them. Um, try not to get into acronym world, you know, the RNG, the, the random number generator. So if I have an electronic table game, which has been a huge source of growth throughout the world and you see the stadium setups in Macau and Vegas, they're quite exciting and you see them at the gaming shows displayed. I can only have really roulette because I need to have a live wheel with a live ball. Um, I don't necessarily have to have a, a, a live dealer, um, but I, I can't do that with blackjack and baccarat because I can't really get the, an electronic machine to handle live cards. So it has to be a random number generator to do a computer simulation to give people the, the chance of playing electronic baccarat, electronic table games, some of these other pieces, which once again is greater customer choice and, and, and typically greater pricing flexibility as well. You know, I'm loath to put a five pound blackjack table there because I have to pay for the electricity and the cost of a dealer and everything else. But if it's just electronic table game, I can put a one pound or a five pound blackjack uh, offering out there and, and, and have customers having greater price uh, flexibility uh, as well. Cashless is being discussed. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I don't carry cash around anymore. And in London, there's so many great buskers, street musicians plying their trade. I used to always have a few coins, you know, or a, a small note to, to, to give to a saxophonist or, you know, whomsoever, some, you know, a naturally gifted young child playing the violin on the street corner. I, I loved that about being in London. And, and But I just don't carry cash anymore. And yet we're not allowed to go currently into a cashless environment, which was in the white paper and we're now under consultation on. And, and the last, and there's more topics, but the last one I'll talk on is credit. You know, if you are uh, running domestic policy, a thing that you want to do is to bring in someone from overseas that will gamble and potentially at the end of the year, some will win, some will lose, but I, uh, you know, ostensibly the casino is supposed to be ahead at the end of the year. So now you have this economic importation of foreign currency and the economic multiplier effect of money coming across a border. Nevada has seen that with California. Nevada has seen that with Asian play. It's just a tremendous economic benefit. And yet we can't give credit to someone from overseas. They're not going to come with 50,000 pounds in a paper bag. They're not allowed to bring 50,000 pounds cash in a paper bag. And yet that's a customer that you want in your casino. And I want to be able to offer that customer credit. Um, so these are just a, a few of the items, more machines, random number generator, cashless credit. There's a few uh, items that are under consultation that will all be positive for uh, the business. And I hope it moves from a white paper and consultation and what I would describe as vaporware to actually something that we can, you know, we're looking at our casinos to see where we can put in uh, more machines, you know, right now. We want to go as fast as we possibly uh, can. Uh, I think on behalf of the customers and on behalf of our shareholders and on behalf of the people that collect tax in the UK and the people in the UK that want more employment and the people in the UK that want capital investment and, you know, all these things are positive uh, in these economic trying times. So let's go, go, go uh, as fast as we can, as far as I'm, I'm concerned.
Well, and, and speaking of expansion, you know, you guys also recently uh, launched your online platform as well, which again ties into the, you know, the white paper in the terms of that's what was um, mainly centered around was, you know, the, the, the harms or potential harms of online gaming. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, you know, your platform and kind of what, uh, what you wanted, it, how you wanted it to launch and kind of how it's gone in the, in the short time since? I believe it's about a, a little over a month old. Am I right? Yeah, I think we're we're, get, we're getting close to two. Okay, <laughs> uh, just a baby, just a yeah. baby. So what um, was the timing of that specific to uh, you know everything that was going on, or was that just the the scheduled time, regardless? Yeah, no, I mean I would have gone quicker if I could have. I mean the yeah, reality yeah. is we were the largest lawn, land based casino operator in the UK that did not have an online offering, um, and we have a large and active database of players that we know empirically is gambling on, with online products. And we know since we didn't have one <laughs> that they weren't gambling with us. Oh. So, you know, the, the, the economic thesis is, you know, the economic cost of acquiring these people and the ab ability to retain them as we already have a relationship with them through our bricks and mortar operation um, is that a, a, a scaled, um, you know, we're, we're not starting. We didn't build our own technology. I don't have 100 programmers in Israel or he, in the UK or, yeah. you know, somewhere else working. We're with a great partner, uh, Aspire, that has a, a, has a platform with us. We're not putting our name on the strip, of which is controversial, but we wouldn't have tried to put our name on the front of the Manchester United Jersey, uh, which is quite expensive or, you know, a massive uh, television budget. We're going softly, softly. You know, our customers are gambling online. Now we have an omni-channel offering for them. We think we have a nice product for people that are gambling online that aren't bricks and mortar customers. If you become an online customer with us in Glasgow or in London or, you know, Manchester, one of these places where we operate, then you can get a bricks and mortar relationship with us as well. You can get this omnichannel uh, relationship where, you know, we can take care of you when, when, when you come in. So, you know, we just think with, um, you know, solid aspirations, but manageable aspirations. We're not looking for world domination in marketing spend or spend on tech, but this is just a real nice, once again, it goes, goes back to being customer centric. This is a, an offer for our customers, an expanded offer for our uh, customers that, uh, you know, we think will be win-win. Well, I got to say, I, I got to say, I like that answer because all too often, I feel like I talk to a lot of these operators and when we get on the topic of iGaming and online platforms, they like all of a sudden almost like lose their head and start like expounding on like all these different things. And I'm kind of like, I don't know, you know, I'm kind of like, I don't know about that, but I, I really like your uh, the way that you put it in the, the kind of framing it within those expectations, I think is really smart. Um, so with regards to reward systems, and this is something that I'm curious about because obviously, and you know as well that, um, you know, reward systems in the US are just really, I mean, they're becoming one of the most important, if not the most important um, tools for an operator to have in their arsenal in terms of, you know, customer acquisition, you know, customer retention and all that kind of stuff. Um, how have you guys been building out your, uh, your Met card program and uh, how is, has it been successful thus far, at least in your opinion? Sure. Um, well, this company was historically owned by Caesars that has its historical roots in Harrah's and my coming up through the business was with Harrah's as well. And, and I think, you know, I was witness on the sideline to some revolutionary work by Gary Loveman and, and, and others in, in building out the, the, the loyalty program. Clearly, as we acquired the business from Caesars, we have to cut the umbilical cord to their loyalty program and move on and do our own thing, um, which we have done. Um, but but the, those of us that remained in the business from being owned by Caesars and certainly my uh, heritage and legacy with the business certainly appreciates what a good loyalty program has uh, has done. Um, 
I love that uh, uh, Jackie, our head of marketing, came up with uh, Jack Queen King Club Ace. You probably tell me that was done somewhere else, but I'm so used to diamonds and platinums and you yeah. know medals all over the you know scarce medals all over I the world. I, I love our Jack Queen Club Ace uh, program, um, and, and as always, it's trying to um, you know build a, a relationship with, uh, with 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 customers that. Um, you know, behooves them to uh, spend time with, uh, with with us. You know, others have said that the casino business is not always monogamous. People visit two or three casinos on a on a on on a trip. You know, I certainly know with my hotels and my loyalty program and my airline and my loyalty program that my the first place I look. Uh, for a hotel or for a flight, and I might have a price or a time of a flight gets me somewhere else. I might book somewhere else, but my first choice is always, you know, with with this specific hotel brand and this specific airline brand. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's what we want too. We have, you know, skilled and competent competitors here in the UK uh, market, and you know, I hope a rising tide floats all boats, and we all. Uh, do well on a, on a on a go forward basis, and the government recognizes tax contribution, employment contribution, capital spend, uh, in, you know, contribution to tourism, and all these things. I hope collectively, which we lobby together to try to explain to government all the positives of of this industry. But at the same time, you know, I'm fiercely competitive. If someone's walking down the street and you know, at Leicester Square, there's four different companies within, you know, a very short walk that you can walk in the door. I want to have an entanglement of reasons. I want it to be customer service. I want it to be the quality of the food. I want it to be the breadth of the product. But I assure you, I also want it to be the quality of our loyalty program that someone says, <laughs> if I stay here just a little bit longer, do I get to another tier? Do I get, you know, a different, you know, re reward. Um, and, 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 and I want that to be on spend on food and on beverage and on entertainment and, you know, all these different offerings. I just want people to, 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 to be excited to, to, you know, participate in our, um, in our, in our company. <laughs> No, I get that for sure. And, and you know, just from my perspective, like I said, in such a short amount of time uh, to see you guys, you know, propping up all these all these pillars of, of a business like this, it's, it's honestly it's impressive. Um, one thing I want to talk to you about as well that uh, I feel like doesn't really get that much attention and or um, focus is the North African market. Um, uh, Metro obviously operates three uh, Egyptian venues. Um, what's the current North African landscape in your eyes? Because, you know, I sit here as somebody who, you know, works for a global, you know, gaming publication and I read all these reports from Australia and the US and UK and Asia and feels like everywhere else but Africa. And what is so what is kind of your view of uh, North Africa as it stands right now? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know if I'm a geopolitical uh, expert on, on, on North Africa, but certainly there's a variety of places that people you know, in that part of the world, like to go to, uh, to, you know, R&R. &R. Yeah. Um, and, you know, historically, that's been uh, Beirut and, and Lebanon. And tragically, that that city has had a number of <laughs> challenges that you might need someone more astute and educated than me to explain. That's a different uh, process, yeah. <laughs> the, the geopolitical drama there. Yeah. Uh, Dubai is one um, where right now there's no uh, gaming, you know, we're watching Win and, and the development there wow. with an interested uh, eye. Um, and, and, and Cairo is another place that people in that part of the world like to go to. You know, there's world class hotels. We operate in a uh, Four Seasons. We operate in a, in a Hilton that's right in the in the center of uh, the Four Seasons is by Giza and the pyramids. We've got pretty good geographic proximity. So we have one out by the pyramids. We have one in the center of town near the uh, Egyptian uh, museum where, you know, King Tut and other things are, are, are on display. We have one out at Heliopolis by the airport in a, in a place that's rebranding as a, as a Waldorf. So we're in these luxury, we're partnered with these luxury hotel brands and, and, and the owners of these businesses. And, and you have tremendous tourism in the, in the region with people that are looking to uh, you know, rest and, 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 and relax. So there's, 
you know, a reasonably vibrant uh, business. And some folks have been, I don't know, more regional in their in their travel and, you know, less, you know, not the 10 hour, <laughs> eight hour flights, you know, the shorter flights. And I think Cairo has really benefited from that. Morocco uh, also, um, you know, to the extent that I, I follow that has a thriving, um, you know, casino business as well. So, you know, you just look for the things that an established operator you need you know you need a good regulatory uh environment you don't want to be in the in the in, in the wild uh west and and you know if you have good tourism infrastructure if you have a good regulatory uh environment you can set up a nice little uh business in uh in 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 in, in cairo so well that's fascinating like i said i don't really get to hear much of anything uh coming out of that market so that's fascinating for sure um, you know, we've had a really wide ranging conversation so far, and I thank you so much for joining me, but I'll, uh, I'll get you out of here on this. Um, you know, what's next? What are the next, uh, you know, two to five years look like for you and, uh, and the rest of the team? Yeah, look, you know, we want to continue our strong year over year growth. We have spare licenses in London and Birmingham and Leeds that we would like to uh, deploy, um, you know, if we if we get you know, what, what I hope will be uh, coming uh, literally in months, not years, if we get, you know, a, a good sense of, uh, you know, visitation coming back, I, we, we would like to, you know, continue to roll out the Metropolitan brand with, uh, with refurbishments at, at existing uh, estates. We just won the compliance team of the year in Europe. So I hope, uh, you know, in a very uh, strict uh, regulatory environment. I hope we continue our compliance, uh, adherence, and 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 excellence. Um, you know, two months of our online business. We'd like to continue to grow uh, that. So, you know, that's pretty basic, isn't it? But grow the existing business um, potentially with refurbishments and rebranding. Uh, expand the business and look for new channels like uh, like online and you know the white paper we didn't talk about sports betting is you know potentially allows sports betting so you know i'm pretty sanguine and optimistic about our uh future here so uh i think the future is uh is bright in london you don't have to wear shades but <laughs> the future is still bright <laughs> Well, that's a great way of putting it. And uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining me again. And uh, best of luck to you in uh, Metropolitan moving forward. All right. Thank you so much. We thank you for joining us on this episode of the GGB Podcast sponsored by IGT. With IGT's Resort Wallet, your players will experience the convenience of digital transactions throughout your resort property. Learn more at IGT.com slash cashless. To learn more about Jim, Interblock Gaming, and all the important issues in gaming, subscribe at ggbmagazine.com. To stay current with the weekly news of the gaming industry, subscribe to ggbnews.com and use the coupon code GGB180 for a free subscription. Don't miss an episode of the GGB podcast by subscribing on Amazon, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts today. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.